Hey everyone, we're going to get started. Um, thank you for coming out to our event today with the former Rich Moratorium. Um, before we begin, I'm just going to give you guys a brief quote about the Federal Society. Fed Talk is with conservative and libertarian lawyers, law students, and law professors interested in a current state of the legal order. The title of the principle is that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of government from power is essential to our Constitution, and that it is entirely the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is, not what it should be. For those at law school, I facilitate debates and discussions that are informed students can make informed decisions for themselves. Debate, discuss, decide. Our event today is a standalone speech, so Mr. Hanneke will come up and talk about the moratorium, and there will be an opportunity for QA. This event will be recorded for viewing afterwards. However, the QA will not be recorded, so we'll not go as in to ask any questions you have. Mr. Robert Hanneke is, is the Executive Director and General Counsel at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. He has served as a twice elected Kerr County Attorney. Mr. Hennessy has also served as an Assistant Attorney General under Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott. Additionally, he has appeared on national news shows such as Fox News, Fox Business, MSNBC, with commentaries that have been published in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, The Hill, and too many others to name. Mr. Hennessy holds a bachelor's degree in English literature from Georgetown and at JD from the University of Texas. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Rob Hennigke. I'm the executive director of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And here, uh, relevant to y'all, I run the Public Interest Litigation Center within the foundation. TPBF, we're a nonprofit research institute. And our Center for the American Future, we represent individuals and businesses in challenging unconstitutional and unlawful uh, government actions. It's great to be with y'all. Uh, and as, uh, as, as Tim mentioned, I'm going to reserve time at the end for, for Q&A. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for, for bringing me out here. Uh, I love doing this. I love being at law schools and sharing the work that we do. Uh, I really wish you the best in your future legal career. And commend you for having the intellectual curiosity to be here and to be part of the Federalist Society uh, in the first place. Uh, a couple of things that I want to, to share with you all. Uh, just to make you aware, tough airline times. Uh, usually I, I hang out afterwards for as long as people want to chat, but uh, I've got a tight connection. And my wife's going on a work trip. She's at the airport now. Uh, in the state of Texas, we kind of frown if both of us are out of state because uh, I got kids at home. So I'm going to have to hit the door to do that. Otherwise, I'd love to stay, but I welcome, invite all y'all to email me or, or DM or whatever, reach out and keep the discussion going. Uh, but I just apologize for that advance. Secondly, Justice Breyer just said he's retiring. So get ready. We we'll talk about that in QA, but uh, whoa, uh, that just happened. Well, that's not what I'm here to, to talk about. I'm here to talk about uh, the uh, federal eviction moratorium that was uh, put into place during uh, the, the COVID pandemic. And I'm here to talk about that because we litigated a case that uh, challenged the constitutionality of the eviction moratorium. The case was called uh, Turkel versus the Centers for Disease Control. And the reason the case is called uh, Turkel is because our client was, uh, is, was Lauren Turkel. I'm gonna tell you about Lauren, uh, Mrs. Turkel. So she uh, grew up in the, the Tyler area of Texas, which is kind of Northeast Texas. And uh, when her grandfather died, uh, he left her the house that he had grown up in. And, and she converted it into a fourplex and started renting it out to have uh, additional sources of you know, income. She's not a big land baron, she's not a big commercial real estate owner, she's got a rent house. But she used it to make additional money uh, to help pay the bills, to pay, help pay for some, some extras. And I uh, had four tenants uh, because it was a fourplex. So in September 20th of 2020, the Centers for Disease Control issued an order called the Temporary Halt in Residential Evictions to Prevent the Further Spread of COVID-19. This order from the Centers for Disease Control made it a crime to evict a covered person from a residence. A crime punishable by up to one year in prison 
and up to a $250,000 bond. And notably, the, the CDC's order, the Centers for Disease Control, which is the federal agency uh, under the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, specifically said that the order did not cancel the rental uh, owed or change any of the, of the other terms of the rental agreement. It just made it a crime to evict a tenant for non-payment of rent. Uh, this order was put in place, like I said, in September of 2020. Uh, it was extended uh, to the end of the year. It was then one of the first executive orders that uh, President Biden signed and he uh, was sworn in. Uh, and then it was extended again uh, in, in March. So when we talk about evictions, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the process for removing uh, a trespasser from private property. And let me explain real quick how this works in Texas and why we have evictions. I mean, evictions in Texas is called forceful detainer and removal statute, which is a statutory scheme that sets forth the process to be able to uh, have somebody taken off their, your property uh, that's a trespasser. And the reason why we have that is because you know, our system of civil jurisprudence uh, has moved away to uh, away from self-help. I mean, back at, at common law, what would you do if you had a trespasser at your house? You would get some buddies and you'd go in there and track the person out and throw them in the street and rough them up a little bit. We don't do that. Uh, we have a, a system of laws. We have a system of, pro of civil process. Uh, that is set up to, in the adversarial system, provide for a peaceable way of resolving disputes. So in Texas, there is a very, very extensive scheme where if you have a, a trespasser on your property, if you have a holdover tenant who's in breach of the lease, if you have a squatter, if you have, uh, you know, your, your uh, you know, second cousin from, from Phoenix who just won't leave, there's a way that you can go to court, show that you are entitled to superior possession of the, the property before notice, go through a judicial process. And at the end of this process, you, the court will issue you a writ of eviction, uh, which then you can give to a law enforcement officer who then has the authority to go in and pull that person out of your property. So that's what eviction is. Eviction is when the, the holdover person has no legal right to the premises and is a mechanism to remove persons uh, from, from private property. So the federal government, through the CDC order, made it a crime for a private property owner or residential property to use that process to remove a trespasser from private property. So I want to talk a little bit about our case strategy. Because, you know, the, the first question that, that comes to mind, that came to our mind, is how does the Centers for Disease Control have the power to block residential evictions? To take it a little broader, how does the federal government have power to block residential evictions? You know, Lauren Kirkell was not a nationwide real estate conglomerate. She lived in Texas. She owned a rent house in Tyler. And what happened with her was that when this eviction moratorium went into place, she had all four of her units rented. And one of the, the units was rented to a uh, boyfriend girlfriend. And the girlfriend was the one that worked. The boyfriend was kind of a deadbeat. And they got into a fight. She moved out. And the guy stuck around. Didn't have a job, didn't try to get a job. And so uh, Mrs. Perkel then went to uh, evict him, and uh, the CDC order uh, blocked her ability to go through the Texas state legal process to do so. So not only then did she have this holdover tenant not paying rent, meanwhile, she's got to pay property taxes, she's got to pay the utilities, she's got to pay the maintenance of the property. But this guy starts to be a jerk. Because nobody can do anything to him. So he starts harassing the other tenants who were in the property who start saying, hey, Lauren, I'm not going to renew. 
I'm not going to live next next door to this, you know, this jerk. Uh, so they start getting notice as well. So the, the, the guy that's not, she's got, you know, rent paying uh, tenants who are moving out because the guy that's not paying rent is stuck there and she can't do anything about it. I, I found that that was incredibly unfair. So in this eviction order, the, the CDC claimed that it was, um, and, and I know that y'all know the statute off the top of your head, uh, but 42 U.S.C. 264A, favorite line, no, I've never heard of it before, this, which gave it the authority under the HHS statutory authority to, and, and here's, here's the statute, make and enforce such regulations as necessary to prevent the introduction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries into states or from one state into another. Well, communicable disease. If that applies to the virus, man, that seems like a really broad grant of authority. You know, but under this argument, if this statute, uh, which was gave the CDC the authority to regulate communicable to spread of communicable diseases, uh, could be defined to, to be a virus, well, then what, what else could be defined? Uh, to to be under this this idea of a communicable disease. So we had a client, we had an interest in challenging this, but we weren't the only groups that were looking to challenge. You had a number of other uh, legal groups that were out there, uh, Pacific Legal Foundation, New Civil Liberties Alliance, and others. They took this in a textual approach. And I know we're federal society members, so you know we're all textualists here, we're all visualists here. Um, and, and their focus was looking at the text of this 42 U.S.C. 264A and say, hold on a second, the text of that statute doesn't give the CDC the authority to regulate COVID. Now, under the, the statutory interpretation, under the, the context of the statute, we're not talking about viruses, we're talking about like Ebola or, you know, uh, you know, avian flu or something like so those scary, you know, type of diseases that you see about in movies. And so those groups sued various jurisdictions challenging the, the authority as not being granted under the text of the statute. And I know that that is really what you're going to see commonplace in a lot of the challenges to uh, federal action under any administration. And it's an effective mechanism, especially as courts are more prone to be given greater scrutiny to uh, the statutory text and, and whether that grants federal authority. But to a certain extent, you're playing on a, their side of the battle. You're letting the federal government, you know, define the, the terms of its power, and then you're arguing the details of it. We look at this, we looked at this case and we took a broader approach. The broader approach was to ask, that was that statute. How does the federal government have the power to block the removal of a trespasser from private property in the state of the state? How is this, how is this even a federal power? Or CDC or Department of Housing or whatever, how does the federal government have the power to tell Lauren Turkell, you will go to jail for a year if you kick out this, this, this tenant of yours because he's quit paying rent on your private property? And I think it's some of those broader questions we, we need to be talking about, federalist society, we need to be talking about in, in terms of this context because. It was an interesting dialogue back and forth as, as us and other groups were talking to potential clients and, and kind of the mentality of some of these other groups were, who well, was too ambitious? We got the layup win, we got a statute, we got an APA, we got a textual argument, you know, the statute doesn't mean what they're doing. So we don't need to go into the constitution. We can get the quick score, the easy win with, uh, with just, Arguing the text of the statute, making a statutory argument. It's a very valid approach, but you know, 
kind of my viewpoint, you're missing the forest for the trees with that. I think too often we collectively as a society are, are too accepting of government power as a default. You know, the government says, you got to wear green. And we jump to like, oh, what shade of green? You know, or can it be polka dots? Like, you know, is it like lime green or dark green? And we, we don't go back and say, well, what are you telling me what to do in the first place? But I believe in our constitution, our framework of government, and why our nation was created the way that it was. You know, the, the, the formation of the United States was a rejection of centralized national power. We fought a war of independence to rid ourselves from a monarchy and an all powerful uh, executive. And it was the Constitution, in its brilliance and beauty, was purposefully set up to be a check on tyranny. All the different ways that you learn about in civics, in high school, in college, and here in law school, checks and balances, and, and so forth. But it is, it is true that the Constitution sets up the federal government to be one of limited enumerated powers as set forth in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. If the Constitution doesn't grant the power to the federal government, the federal government can't do it. Period, full stop, that's the limitation of the federal government. Uh, and there's, there's no question about that limitation was, was hard written into it by the founding fathers. So where then does this CDC statute derive its authority? Where, where, when this was challenged, did the Department of Justice point to in terms of saying that that was the federal power uh, that they were using in order to, to exercise this power? Because the Constitution does not give the federal government public health powers. The Constitution does not give the federal government police powers. So it doesn't have those. So in order for CDC to issue a statute dealing with communicable diseases, it had to tie and relate to one of the limited and creative powers found in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. And so the, the, the federal government, as we expected, claimed that it was the Commerce Clause that was the enumerated power that provided the constitutional authority for the residential eviction moratorium. Commerce Clause. Well, so what is that? Well, it's the provision of the Constitution that gives Congress, the federal government, the, the power to, to regulate uh, commerce amongst the states, interstate commerce. So already in the text of the Constitution, there is a limit to that power. The Constitution does not give the federal government the power to regulate commerce. It gives the federal government the, the, regulate, the power to regulate commerce amongst the states, interstate commerce. And so there is a limit to that power. Now, where that limit is, is something that's been debated over the past several hundred years of our country, but it's indisputed the way that the Constitution is written at some point somewhere, there is a limit to federal powers under the uh, Commerce Clause. There's a line, and, and that's what this case uh, is on. So I think that, you know, this case is a good case study in, in the tension over the limits to the Commerce Clause that's played out in federal courts throughout our nation's history. And let me tell you why. You really see the evolution of the Commerce Clause. And if you go back to the origins of our government, if you talk about uh, the Federalist Papers, I mean, this is a Fed stock lecture, so we've got to quote the Federalist Papers, right? Uh, but you look at Federalist Number 17, for example, is that uh, local matters should always be handled by local legislatures. The administration of private justice between the citizens of the same state is proper to be provided for by local legislation and can never be desirable cares of general jurisdiction, rejecting that idea of a, a national power. Uh, Federalist 33, uh, that Congress's attempts to regulate local matters such as those outside of commerce power, are not good law. I'm not sure what could be more of a local matter than 
taking out a deadbeat tenant from a rent house in Tyler, Texas. So the founders kind of had in mind that there were limits to this, this power that was given. And it was initially recognized in some of the early jurisprudence that then pulled from the Commerce Clause. Uh, if you look at McCullough v. Maryland, which I'm sure you all had common law you've studied, you know, this was the, the case that challenged whether uh, the state of Maryland would, would be able to impose a tax on the bank that Congress had set up and located in Maryland. And one of the issues was whether the federal government could constitutionally incorporate a bank. Uh, but also, the question was whether the bank was constitutional as necessary and proper to the Commerce Clause. And uh, here, the Supreme Court held that it was constitutional for the federal government to do this as part of the Commerce Clause powers. But it was a federal bank. And the federal bank, the question was whether that uh, the federal government pursuant to its powers would be able to do that. If you look also at uh, another 1L con law case, it would be a uh, This was a dispute between uh, you know, New York and New Jersey over regulation of the, uh, uh, the waters between the two. Uh, there was two competitors of the steamboat monopoly and they, they fought each other and uh, you know, the, the common waterway between the two states. And here in this case, the Supreme Court held that, you know, federal regulation of an interstate waterway between two states was valid under its Commerce Clause. So therefore, they held it. So really the, the initial Supreme Court cases, the first ones that you, you learn about, you know, were dealt with very specific uh, federal you know, actions involving exercise of commerce between uh, several states or exercising of you know, the federal government's powers. That took a hard left turn when you got to the, the New Deal programs of the, the 1930s and the, the FDR administration. This, you know, tied into uh, the switch in time to save nine, where you had uh, President Roosevelt uh, threatened to stack the Supreme Court because he was tired under the original kind of framework of the Supreme Court striking down this New Deal programs. And so there was a saber rattling of, if you don't start ruling the right way, I'm just going to stack the court so I can get what I want. And, and the court came. And so in the New Deal cases, then you started to see what I would say is the alternative view uh, of the Commerce Clause in this ongoing tension. And that was really more of just a rational basis. If, if Congress could make an argument that a regulation had something to do with, with commercial activity, then yeah, of course the federal government could regulate. I mean, there's commerce in there somewhere, right? So this then led to cases that really allowed for the explosion of the administrative state when we no longer had a check on the executive branch to be able to be limited to activities of, of interstate commerce. And, and a couple I'll point out is you have the, uh, uh, the Wayne Wright, uh, Wright Wood Dairy case from 1942 uh, regarding whether the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1937 allowed the Secretary of Agriculture to price fix milk, set minimum prices for milk uh, in interstate uh, commerce. But the milk at issue was entirely intrastate milk, didn't cross state lines. Uh, and yet now the court held that it was constitutional for, for that regulation to be upheld under the Commerce Clause. Uh, Similar analysis in the, the, the infamous Wickard versus Filburn case, where you have uh, basically during wartime national quotas on the, uh, the, the production and sale of wheat. Uh, and so Roscoe Filburn was the owner of a small farm in Ohio. Uh, and he, he farmed and raised wheat. What he did was he had a separate field where he raised wheat purely for his own personal family consumption. So he had wheat he was going to grow and sell, which was within the permit, whatever he had. 
And then he had like a week, he was going to bake bread, he had his family on. And so he got dinged for, for busting his quota, basically, and, and challenged this exercise of federal regulation on the, the set aside wheat that he was growing purely for his own personal consumption. And the court upheld the, the regulatory burden on him, uh, essentially finding a way to connect his consumption of wheat to uh, then decreasing the, the wheat that he was purchased or consumed in the marketplace that then had a tie to, to interstate commerce. And so the court was satisfied that this pure intrastate non-commercial activity in terms of Mr. Uh, Filburn's uh, growing and harvesting of wheat for personal consumption could therefore be reached under uh, the commerce laws. And look, I mean, if the federal government can regulate your, your backyard herb garden, uh, then it really begs the question as I mean, that view of the Commerce Clause, really what is the limit? Where is the extent of that? But that was how kind of the, the Commerce Clause viewpoint shifted during the, the New Deal programs in the 30s and the 40s that just allowed the explosion of the administrative state. It got pulled back here during my lifetime in the mid 90s and since. And really, where you kind of see the modern jurisprudence and kind of this tension going back and forth. Uh, the two cases in, in 1995, uh, Lopez, United States versus Lopez, that dealt with uh, possession of a firearm in the gun free zone area. And what's interesting about Lopez, um, I didn't know until I, I reread these cases here recently is that Lopez was actually paid to take the gun to school. But still, the Supreme Court there held that possession of a firearm in a, a local area was not an interstate commercial activity. And the court kind of fleshed out the third category of commerce clause analysis, which was substantial effects test, Traditionally, under the original idea of the framers, you had channels of interstate commerce, trains, rivers, air travel, you know, when it came about. You had, uh, and then you had instrumentalities of, of interstate commerce, uh, actual exchange of food and services across state lines. But they, the Lopez fleshed out activities that have a substantial effect on interstate commerce as being reachable under the Commerce Clause, but held that this, this, this went too far. And then the court further fleshed that out in the Morrison case in 2000, which, which struck down uh, provisions involving the Violence Against Women Act, you know, finding that um, uh, domestic violence, which is, of course, reprehensible uh, and, and deplorable, but still domestic violence, the act of domestic violence, was not an interstate commercial activity. And Morrison fleshed out Lopez by adding considerations for the court to look at in terms of kind of understanding the substantial effects test as to you know whether you were talking about an economic or non non-economic activity, whether there was a limiting jurisdictional principle, uh, such as the regulation only dealt with crossing state line type activities, uh, whether Congress had entered any finding specific to that regulation tying it to uh, uh, interstate uh, commercial activity uh, and, and four, uh, whether it, it uh, basically crossed the bounds and would leave, did lack the limiting factors that it was hard to find where the limits were in federal power. What's interesting about these cases, while I'm pointing them out to you, is the, the United States government, Department of Justice, in both of those cases, argued the rational basis perspective from Wickard and from their case. And in the minority opinions of both those cases, the minority of those justices adopted that in their dissent. So again, there's still the tension here between uh, the viewpoint, the, 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 the New Deal viewpoint of an unlimited, uh, basically, whatever is reasonable connection of commerce along with the federal purview, that loss, but it lost there. 
So jump forward to then this case and with the, the residential eviction moratorium, um, we brought the challenge here and it was the, the position of the federal government that again, really continuing this argument as far as like a rational basis or reasonable connection, like look, renting a house involves an exchange of money. You know, real estate, uh, you know, rental real estate is an economic activity. So therefore anything that has to do with, with uh, renting a real estate is reasonably related to that and then falls within the, the purview of the federal government. And their argument in the eviction moratorium as far as connecting it to interstate commerce was that, uh, you know, people will get evicted. Some of those people will not be able to find alternate housing. Some of those people may have COVID. And some of those people, unspecified number of those people, may have to move across state lines to find a new place to live. It's a pretty tenuous chain of connection from you know, what starts off as an economic activity. And it's the case law that tells us that the proper inquiry for the Commerce Clause analysis is actually the focus of the regulated activity. You don't look at the category of what's an issue. Otherwise, really, there would be no limiting principle to the Commerce Clause you look at the specific regulated activity. And here, Judge Barker uh, in the Eastern District of Texas agreed with us that the regulated activity was the action of the eviction, the action of the removal of a trespasser for private property uh, who, uh, for non payment of rent. That was the regulated activity. Regulated activity was not the rental of real estate. The regulated activity was the civil legal process remove that person and they had no legal title or legal status to remain there. And so moving now back more to, I think, the original intent here, the court walked through the factors. And in fact, the one economic, non-economic, the federal government's position was, of course, it's economic. It has to deal with renting real estate, right? The court said no. The specific focus is on the regulated activity was an eviction. Eviction is a state legal process uh, that is not an economic activity. Second factor was whether there was any kind of jurisdictional limit. Did the CDC eviction order, order only apply to people who would have to move across state lines? They got evicted. Well, no, it applied to all residential housing across the United States in all respects. Were there any kind of congressional findings that tied this to interstate commerce? No, the CDC order had tons of stuff talking about why COVID was bad and the number of people who got sick and people who got died, you know, died and, and the impact of COVID, but it wasn't anything that tied it to a commercial activity. Uh, and finally, the court agreed that this had, uh, there was no limiting principle here so that it, it led to the, the usurpation of of the power to properly resolve the state. So we won that case. We won a final judgment of the Commerce Clause declaring what the federal government did uh, was unconstitutional. It's now a, a published opinion. It really hasn't been a significant Commerce Clause win against the federal government since Morrison uh, in 2000. But I think it really shows how, and especially with, and this is what I'll leave you all with before we get to, to questions, how things are in play now, especially with the, the you know, the, the current situation of Congress ceasing to act as a, a co-equal branch of government and the executive branch really now being the policymaker for the government. And as you're having just more justifications of, of policy in the pandemic, for example, the recent litigation over the vaccine mandates, it's going to trigger these original questions. And you know, my challenge to y'all uh, would be that when we see these issues, when we see these in current events, pull back to the forest. Think about the original framework of the Constitution. Think about the limited enumerated powers that exist. And really question for yourself, 
how does what the federal government is doing does it how does it fit within one of those powers and does it clearly do so i think we should be very very skeptical about uh the proper federal role in that so thank you very much for for having me it's been a lot of fun and uh look forward to y'all's questions <laughs>